Paul writes, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You may be seated. It was a dark and damp basement. It felt a little more like a dungeon than it did a Sunday school room, which it was. And every Sunday morning in elementary school, I would make my way down into the basement of the little church I grew up in. And I would go into this dark and damp, poorly lit Sunday school room for my class with Mrs. Engler. Now, Mrs. Engler was a librarian a librarian Monday through Friday. Her father had been the minister of the church where I was going to church as a kid, and no one ever met the standard that she had for how you're supposed to behave in church. If you ever wonder why I'm cool with kids being kids at church, it's because I had Sunday school with Mrs. Engler. <laughs> Mrs. Engler was a large and imposing woman, and she would have that librarian look no all due respect to librarians in the room. And when it came time for us to pray, she would put that finger in the air and look at us with a death stare. I want every eye closed, and I want every head bowed, and I want every hand folded, because we're going to pray. She said it with more authority than my high school football coach. And she made it clear to us there was one way to pray. She made it clear to us that prayer was a solemn moment of reverence. And that if you weren't solemn, and if you weren't reverent, and if your eyes weren't about to bleed from being squeezed so tight, and your knuckles weren't about to get bloody from folding your hands so much, you were dishonoring God. And when you didn't pray the right way, she would walk around that circle and flip you in the ear. Jerry the King Lawler had no strength up on Mrs. Engler. She would let you know when you were not offering the reverence that was demanded of God. I am so grateful that I later read the Bible and learned that prayer is more than bloody knuckles. <laughs> And that prayer is more than a solemn moment of silence and reverence. You see, the good news is, when the Bible talks about praying, about having a conscious connection with God, it is not simply a moment of solitude, though it can be. No, the Bible talks about prayer, of intentional time with God, is that which is a catalyst to bring joy and peace to a bitter heart and a divided world. Catal prayer is a catalyst for us to be agents of peace and goodness and love in a divided world. We have been reading through the book of Colossians. One of the things we like to do at our church is take really complex things in the Bible and digest it in simple chunks. Make it clear for us how to take these big doctrinal truths and put it in a way that all of us can live it on Monday. As I like to say, your faith on Monday is more important than your faith on Sunday. And the book of Colossians shows us that prayer is more than a solemn moment. Prayer is a way for us to be with God so that we can be different when we go to work, when we walk in the neighborhood, and when we sit down with our families to figure out how to make life work. This scripture that we read begins with these very simple words. Devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. Now, I always struggle with what words actually mean and how you define them, so let me put this in a way maybe some of you can get. To devote yourself is this. 
If you're still wearing your Arkansas Razorback t-shirt this morning after they got hammered by Alabama yesterday, you have devoted yourself to the Razorbacks. You have devoted. If you're still wearing your Oklahoma hat after my Horn Frogs beat them yesterday, you are a devoted follower. You see, when Paul invites us to be people who are devoted to prayer, it's not fair weather. I pray when life is good. I pray when life is tough. I pray when I'm overflowing with joy. I pray when I don't want to get up out of bed. And this prayer isn't for us to look super spiritual for everyone around us, but we pray, we're devoted to prayer, so that we can be equipped for the challenges that life brings our way. Anyone here dealing with challenges you did not sign up for? Prayer is the pathway to help us engage those challenges. Paul says when we devote ourselves to prayer, the first thing that happens is we become thankful. We become people of gratitude. I am not a cultural commentator, but I don't think it's a reach to say that we have become a petty and cynical culture. We have become a petty and cynical culture. Prayer is the wellspring of gratitude that helps us offset the petty and cynical culture that we swim in. But gratitude is more than simply saying thank you to somebody that holds the door. It's a recognition that every day that God has given me is a gift. And that gift gives me a chance to make a difference. I remember when I was about 13 years old, we are at Grandma's house in Frankfort, Kentucky for Christmas. I had a sister that was 10 years younger than me and two brothers in between us. And I had that burden that all oldest grandchildren get. When the little granddaughter comes along, all of the Christmas presents get consolidated into her rather than the three older brothers. And so we're sitting there opening these presents. And my sister Susan is like opening up, you know, the largest Barbie apartment complex that ever existed in the convertible. And she's opening up all these gifts. And it comes to me and I get my gift and I open it. And I kid you not, it's dress socks. I wanted a Guns N' Roses CD. And I, my grandma didn't buy me Appetite for Destruction, though I wanted it really bad. My sister's got this stack of gifts and I get dress socks and as some of you all know, I have a terrible poker face. And so the disgust was just dripping off my face at Grandma Mitchell. And my mom flips me in the back of the ear like Mrs. Engler and says, Jeffrey, you say thank you. Thank you, Grandma. That is not gratitude. That is getting your mother off your back. Gratitude that comes through prayer is a recognition that every day I have is a gift from God and every opportunity I have is to make a difference, to make this world more like God would want it. When we pray, there is somehow a relationship to our gratitude. Paul also says that when we devote ourselves to prayer, there becomes this boldness and clarity for the church to become what God wanted the church to be. Now, I have done ministry for almost my entire adult life. And one thing that I can attest to is that the reputation of the church is in the trash. And I'm here to tell you, I don't really disagree. I listen to my friends that aren't connected to the church, and I hear their reasons, and I understand them, and I do not doubt them. And in fact, I've come to believe that the best criticism of the church comes from those that are not in it, those, not, not those that are in it. And so when Paul says, pray that we would have doors open so we could clearly share the message of God's revolutionary love, prayer grounds the church in what God wants it to be. A place of welcome, a place of joy, a place of peace, a place where people of different backgrounds can come together, a place where folks, wherever they are in their faith journey or no faith at all, can receive a welcome hand and heart and begin to move their lives forward with people around them that will support them. I don't know about you, when I look at the state of the church, we need all the prayer we can get. And Paul says the strength and clarity of the church doesn't begin with a big sign or a big building, but with prayer that says, God, I will do what you've asked me to do. This day is the answer to like three years of prayer. 
We've been praying for like three years that our church would have a stronger connection with our child care center. And I was like, I just don't want to be the church known for the best child care. I want to be the church known with the best bald minister. I like to poke fun at myself if you all didn't know this. This day is an answer to prayer. And then finally, Paul says, when you pray, when you connect with God, however you do it, not only will your gratitude grow, not only will the church become more like the church that Jesus wants it to be, you will be wise and gracious with people that are different than you. Did you catch that? Paul has a passion for people of faith to be welcoming and hospitable and courageous and loving to folks that have a different background than they do. When we pray, God softens our heart to be open to those that we may have very little in common with. One of the things I love about being the minister of this church is that we sit at the cross section in this neighborhood where you walk a mile any direction, you're going to find a million dollar home, you're going to find section 8 housing, and you're going to find everything in between. You can't walk a block from our church and not bump in to someone that is different than you. And we have got to be equipped as the city of Memphis, and I think only God's going to help us do it. To be a place where we know how to live together and love together and serve together. And Paul says the more we pray, the more equipped we are to build bridges rather than to build walls. Paul wants us to pray because the old attitudes and old traditions of division have to go. And I want to announce that my dream for us is a community is that we would be a place where people that are young and old and black and white and rich and poor and gay and straight can come together and pray together and serve together and live together and find relationships in common ground because I still believe we are all God's children. We are all God's children. But to see what we've never seen before, we must pray as we've never prayed before. Because the life that God designed you for doesn't begin by doing more and trying harder. It begins with setting aside time to just be with God. One of the rules that I try to never break as a communicator is I never want to add on just a few more boxes for you to check for your already overextended life. Do we have any busy people in this room? I've been preaching since I was a senior in college from 1998 to 2015. When I would ask people, how are you doing? The number one answer was, I'm really busy. And then somewhere at the end of 2015 and the beginning of 2016, the answer became, I'm so tired. And so for tired people that are busy, and overextended, and have to meld their calendars together as a family to know exactly how far we're driving seven nights a week. I don't want to just give you one more thing for your to-do list. I want to invite you to allow God to start to set your to-do list that is generated by setting aside time to pray. When I was a sophomore in high school, I'm, I'm, you guys can laugh at me, this is the closest I ever came to doing drugs. Are you ready? <laughs> All right. I, I've never done drugs. I've done some stupid stuff that I can't say in the pulpit. But it's the closest I ever came was my sophomore year in high school. And I wanted to do speed. And I wanted to do steroids. Because I wanted to be starting for the Chicago Bears or the Dallas Cowboys. So that summer, I did a little shopping around, fully transparent. And my dad found out about it, and all that just went out the door. <laughs> what I wanted to do was figure out how to have more energy and more strength within the body that I had, because I really wanted to be a college football player. Well, one of our friends in our little circle, guys that were permanently short and permanently small, that thought one day they're going to wake up and be 6'6", 280, he had an idea. He said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go down to Sites Gas Station, on a Friday, right before the game, and we're going to get a case of Jolt Soda. Now, if you didn't grow up in the Midwest like I did, 
Jolt is advertised as all the sugar and twice the caffeine. And so we are on a bus on our way for a JV football game in southern Iowa. And we each down a six-pack of Jolt soda that should have killed us. And we go out there and we warm up and we put our helmets on. And for the first three quarters, we played like crazy men. Like we're playing both sides of the ball. There's like 19 guys on our team. I've never made, I've never made more tackles. I've never run for more yards. I've never hit more guys in the head that would get you kicked out of a game today. I was all jacked up on Mountain Dew, Chip. I was ready to roll. But guess what happened in the fourth quarter? Oh my gosh, did we crash. I don't even remember a play. I scored a touchdown. I don't even remember. Because the crash was worse than the high, and the high was really, really bad. I had the ability to ramp myself up for a short-term push. But when it all caught up with me, I fell really hard. So for all of you that have figured out how to get that short-term push, you do CrossFit at 5 in the morning, you double up on Starbucks, you have a day planner to make sure everything is organized, and you say, if I can just get through this week, if I can just get through this month, if I can just get through this business cycle, if I can just get this kid out of the house, I'll slow down. I'm here to tell you the crash is going to catch up to you like a JV football game. The crash is going to catch up with you. So in closing, I want to give you an invitation of how to declutter your life and how to be with God to rewire all the other hours of your life. I like to make things simple. Three prayers that you can pray. It's just really three questions. If you like to write stuff down, you can put this on your phone, you can write it on a bulletin. Every morning, I answer this question when I pray. God, what do I want? And I try to not get real spiritual about it. I mean, like, I want my cable bill to be late this month. I want gas to go down to 286. I mean, just be real guttural about it. Just be honest. And answer this question before God. God, what do I want? And I found when I do this consistently, God begins to rearrange my desires. And my selfish or self-centered wants start to reside in desires that meet the heart of God for gratitude, for clarity of message, for graciousness with those who are different. That starts to move up the list. So I ask God, I say, answer this prayer every morning. God, what do I want? And then I answer this question, what am I afraid of? What do I fear? I have found in my life, through the help of a good therapist, I've got to answer that question like five times before I really get to the core of what I'm afraid of. When I first began praying this, I would answer it, God, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid nobody's going to like me. And I'm afraid nobody's going to like me. Below that is because I don't think I'm worth knowing. And I don't think I'm worth knowing because I think there's something wrong with me. And I think that there's something wrong with me because I don't even know why God made me in the first place. And that gets me to the bedrock truth I have to decide on. Do I really believe I am loved by God, whether anybody likes me or not? That's what I'm afraid of. How do you pray that prayer? Lord, what am I afraid of? And then finally, what do I surrender? Some of us have been holding on to things since Jimmy Carter was president. Some of us have been holding on to things that we have been keeping quiet or under the table. What do you need to let go of? What do you need to surrender? I have found when I devote myself to this rhythm of life, it helps me be who God made me to be, and it helps me make a difference in the world. So I want to close with a simple prayer. I want to encourage you to maybe put your Bible down or put your bulletin down. Just get comfortable here for 45 seconds. And we're going to pray this simple prayer. I'm going to prompt it, and you talk to God however you choose to. Lord, what do I want?
Lord, what do I fear? Lord, what do I surrender? Oh Lord, Scripture promises that when we devote ourselves to this rhythm of life, that you equip us to make a difference in the world. People who choose gratitude over pettiness. People that have a clarity of purpose. And those that have a grace to live alongside those who are different. Let us be people who make space for our devotion to be expressed. If we let go of our overextended lives for just a moment and breathe deeply with a love we cannot imagine. It's in the name of Christ we pray.